from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me before I offer a message. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is Celebration Sunday. It's the day when we celebrate the year that is to come. We celebrate all that we give to the church and that we will offer to the ministries that are growing in grace through your generosity, our gifts of time and talent and treasure. I'm so thankful for these gifts because really it's the time and talent that are most important of all. It's the leadership of our church members. It's the engagement of our lay people that make this church so strong. I've been especially blessed by this. I've had to uh, be out of the pulpit once in September and once in October. Uh, last month, my wife and I had the joy of going to Gallup, New Mexico, where we were invited to meet the in-laws, the future in-laws of our son, Forrest, who is engaged to be married. And we were invited to the tribal lands of her family in New Mexico, and we were able to see, learn a great deal about the Navajo tribe. We also shared in a dinner where we, both families, gave our blessing to this wonderful couple who will get married in the next year or two or, I don't know, three, we'll find out. Uh, but we did feel like it was so important to uh, meet this family and we were so blessed. And last Sunday I was, uh, I, I fulfilled a commitment. I was uh, committed to going to preach at another church last Sunday. Um, in January or February it was that I agreed to do this. It's to uh, help uh, Reverend Karen Ristine on her renewal leave. She's the pastor of Claremont Methodist Church, United Methodist, and she asked if I would come and preach to some of my former professors who attended at that church, and it was a joy to do so. Um, I had no idea when I agreed to do so that I would be at a whole new church by the time that October rolled around, but I did need to fulfill that commitment. But it was wonderful to know that in doing so, Libby Cook could be liturgist, that Lois Roberts de Kock could preach the message as our lay leader, and they have the ability to do this. And this follows in a long tradition of a strong laity in the church. This is a United Methodist part of our DNA. From the early history of the, the Methodist church, lay persons were strong in leadership in the church. Pastors and the, in the beginning, Anglican priests, but later Methodist pastors could only go so far and so fast on horseback. So lay preachers, oftentimes women, would offer that message every Sunday. And what happened was that the church became strong. The church was forced to become strong in its whole body, not just the head, not just the pastor, but also the whole body. People learned to sustain the strength of the church and to do their part, to pull their weight, to lead in their own way. And we see this happening at San Carlos. And of course, when the church is strong throughout the body, it is far stronger than any one person could ever be. Amen? So we see that as we celebrate our giving today, we, yes, give generously of the finances that our church requires. We also dedicate our time and our talents. I've been asked over the last several months of my ministry here since I started in July, would we be right away hiring a new associate minister 
Um, we have, this church used to have two um, pastors, Reverend Martha and Reverend Greg, both wonderfully able pastors. At this point in our church's life, we are not able to afford a, an associate pastor, so we are going to try to ask people to step up to leadership, to teach, to use your gifts, to lead worship, to sing in the choir, to do whatever we can to make this body of Christ stronger. And uh, we don't know exactly how that will look yet, but I do believe it will be a wonderful vision because we have wonderful talents in this church, so many gifts and graces throughout this congregation. It is time for us to fully employ those for the kingdom of God. Amen? So as we go forward, we do this as one body in Christ. And we do this with persistent faith. In the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the past of our church, the present, and now we will talk about the future. And our theme today is relentless hope, seeking what God wants for God's church for the future. And we do study Jesus' parable of the persistent widow who is relentlessly hopeful for what she needs. She insists on justice from this judge. Jesus lifts her up as a model of prayer and a model of true faith. This is a comical story, really. This judge doesn't care at all about people. He's a lousy public servant. He doesn't care if they have justice or not. But this widow is his match, or even more than his match. She comes and calls on him at his home day and night and insists on him giving her justice. It would have been easy to ignore a widow in these times, widows uh, if they were not married, had no head of household to vouch for them. In these times, it was a very traditional culture. But sh her sheer volume eventually gets his attention. And he says, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. There's another translation of this which says, I will grant her justice before she comes and slaps me in the face. It's in the Bible. <laughs> yes, he was afraid for his very safety after a point, but we see her relentless hope, and we recall that this is what we are called to have as well as we look towards God's future, to give all that we have, all that we are, and to never give up until we see the fruit of God's kingdom through our lives. This is difficult to do. We often become very discouraged by this world. We feel that perhaps the judge of this world has already ruled against us, that we've already failed, that with the natural disasters and the harm that we've waged against the environment, with prejudices that persist in our society that hold people down, perhaps we have already failed miserably. But Jesus calls his followers never to give up. And he says the same to us. We recall that at the time that this scripture was written in the Gospel of Luke, it was around 70 A.D. or 75 A.D. At that time, Christians were being terribly persecuted and were very tempted to give up as the Roman Empire brought down the weight of persecution on them. In fact, in the year 70 A.D., their temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. They needed desperately to hear this message of persistent hope that they shall never give up. And Jesus asks at the end of this parable, when the Son of Man comes at the end of time, will he find faith on earth? Will be, we be ready to receive him or will, will we have abandoned hope? Jesus calls us to have relentless hope to practice hope day in and day out. And to be faithful as God is faithful to us. In our anthem this morning, we heard this wonderful chorus by Mendelssohn. He who watches over Israel slumbers not nor sleeps. And you who walk in grief, you who languish, God will quicken 
you. God will quicken thee. God will give you new life. God is watching over you and does not sleep. Jesus invites us to have a faith like God's faithfulness to us, to not slumber and to not fall asleep, to not despair, but to watch for God always. Our psalm reminds us of this same steadfast faith. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord, who delight in God's laws. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield fruit in their season. Their leaves do not wither in all that they do, they prosper. This has been the theme of our stewardship campaign for the past three weeks, growing in grace, that whatever comes, even if the storms blow against that tree, even if the leaves fall away, we continue to grow. We draw from the unseen waters of God's love. We continue to prosper by God's grace. I was inspired by a church member a few churches ago that I served. Uh, Mary Rose was a woman who had this faith, and yet one day she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and we were all distraught by this. I visited Mary Rose at her home, and as we talked, I said, Mary Rose, how are you doing today? And she said, Pastor James, I am frightened. And this startled me. It really took me uh, by surprise because Mary Rose was a woman of profound faith. I did not expect Mary Rose of all people to be frightened. She said, I'm frightened by death. I don't know what it will be like. I have a fear of dying. As a rather young pastor at the time, I didn't know what to tell Mary Rose. We prayed together and then I left and felt inadequate to the task. I didn't know what I should have said. As I drove back toward my office, I had an epiphany driving in that car and knew exactly what I ought to have said. And so I went back to my office and wrote a letter to her that said, Dear Mary Rose, you are well-versed in loving, serving, and praying for others. Mary Rose had been a faithful school teacher. She had raised a family. She was a faithful church member. So I went on to say, please do not let the fear of dying make you forget what you already know. Love, pray, and hope in God forever through your final breath and beyond. To this day, I remain so grateful that Mary Rose's honesty in the face of death helped us both to learn this truth that we are called to never pursue hope in God, to never lose this love that God has gifted us with, to continually love even to our last breath and beyond. Amen? We're invited to have this faithfulness that God has shown to us. This is truly the attitude of faith that Jesus requires. This question is... When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Oftentimes, as Christian servants, we become tired and we fall into that model of Christian servanthood or even slavery to God, and we think we should solve all the problems, but that's not what God requires. God requires faithfulness, readiness, so that when the Son of Man comes, we will recognize him and be prepared to respond. When those who are in need come to us needing our assistance, we recognize Christ in them and we serve them at that time. When the Son of Man comes, will we have faith? In the beautiful anthem we sang, we heard these words, He watches over Israel. The scripture also calls us to watch. Keep watch and pray not to always be busy, not to always be uh, wearing ourselves out in service, but to be ready to do God's will when it is time. This phrase, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth, is sometimes waged like a threat against Christians. 
I've seen the bumper sticker that's uh, very humorous that I think mocks that bad theology very well. It says, Jesus is coming, look busy. <laughs> that's not what we're called to do. We're called to keep watch, to be awake. Jesus often says, keep awake. Have our eyes open to Christ in one another and to those who are in need who require our service. A world religions professor of mine in college, Houston Smith, uh, taught about this attitude of faith, this attitude of readiness that we're called to have. He said that in Eastern traditions, there's a metaphor of the person of faith as a bird who's on a mountainside, and that bird must keep its wings tilted upward. If its wings are tilted downward, of course, when the, when the winds come, it will be driven down to the ground. But if its wings are tilted upward, it will fly and soar. This is the attitude of faith that we are ready as a church for the year to come. Yes, we believe our vision in this congregation will have to do with discipleship to people of all ages, including children, youth, and persons of all ages in our teaching, in our spiritual growth formation, and also our outreach to the needy in our community. These are the two focuses of the year to come. We are also ready for whatever God will show us, whatever that might be with wings tilted up and with hearts full of faith. So let us practice relentless hope. Let us seek God's future and encourage one another, reminding our own spirits and one another to practice hope with every breath so that Christ will find faith in us. May it be so.